Colossians, we've been in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 10. Let's go back to the book of Colossians as we make our way uh, through this book, verse by verse. Colossians, chapter 1, in verse 10, the scripture says this. Uh, Paul has already told the Colossians that he's praying for them, that they will increase in their knowledge of God and the will of God, the plan of God for them, uh, and, and that they be... Um, have spiritual wisdom and understanding. We've talked about those things. In verse 10, he gives the reason. We started talking about these things last week. Why does Paul want the Colossians to have greater knowledge of God? So that, he says, so that you will walk. This is the reason why. You have to have knowledge of God and His will, and you have to have this wisdom and understanding that you glean from learning the Bible, taught from God by God the Holy Spirit. You have to have this knowledge so that you can walk in a manner. He says, so that you'll walk in a manner that's worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects. And then he says what this will look like in the life of a believer. So here again, we have a list of things that we can evaluate ourselves on. A list like Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruits of the Spirit. Here's another list that he gives us. Uh, He says, if we are walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. And if we are pleasing the Lord, this is what our life will look like. We'll be bearing fruit in every good work. We'll be increasing in the knowledge of God. We'll be strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for the attaining of steadfastness and patience. And we will joyously be giving thanks to God the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in His light inheritance reward for faithful service. So, uh, so we have this, this thought that as we get better and better at doing this, in making our lives look like this, a life that, that comes to understand Jesus more and more every day by studying the book, a life that understands because God the Holy Spirit gives us and teaches us the Bible so that we can have a greater wisdom and understanding as to what God wants us to do down here, as we walk more than in a manner worthy that's, uh, that's worthy of the Lord and please God, our lives will more and more start to look like this. We'll learn, we'll walk, and we'll please. We'll learn, and we'll walk, and we'll please. By the end of this, if we get to it, I'll show you that a lot of people want to skip most of that. The learn part is not popular in our day. The sitting down and opening the Bible and coming to understand what the Bible says, what God wants us to know, it's that learn part that people want to skip over. Can't we just get uh, to to the next part? And I'm telling you, this is the way God has set us up. It's the way He's created us. He expects for us to learn this book that He gave us and to live a proper walk, uh, to live in a specified manner based on the truths He teaches us in this book. So this is the word, the Greek word that we have here, so that you will walk in a manner worthy. We talked about this last time. I'm just going to say what it is. It's the Greek word peripatet when it means to live or behave in a specified manner. Paul's not telling the Colossians to go for a walk around the block. It's not a physical walk. He's talking about their behavior, their lifestyle. And he's telling them that if you have the knowledge of God and if God the Holy Spirit continues to increase your wisdom and your understanding, you can behave in a specified manner. And that manner, obviously, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, walk in a manner that's worthy of Jesus Christ and what He did for you. So... Worthily is the Greek word oxios. In a manner worthy translates one Greek word, oxios. And it means worthy, or it means in a manner befitting or deserving of someone. So we should be struggling, striving to learn the Bible, to learn about God, so that we can walk this life and live a behavior pattern that is deserving of the behavior that Jesus Christ lived. We are to imitate Jesus Christ in our walk through this life. And what did Jesus did? He learned and He walked and He pleased the Father. That's exactly what Jesus did. Paul isn't asking us to do anything that Jesus Christ didn't do. 
Jesus learned from the Father. Isaiah chapter 50 says that very clearly. And He walked a life that was befitting of the Father who sent Him. Remember, not my will, but yours be done. He never did anything that the Father wouldn't have Him do. He always did what was befitting the one who sent Him. He walked in a worthy manner. And He pleased the Father in all respects. Uh, The Bible word is propitiate. He satisfied the Father with everything He did. So as imitators of God, Paul's not asking us to do anything that Jesus didn't do. We are to be imitators of Jesus, and this was his pattern. He learned, and he walked a proper life, and he pleased the Father. It's exactly what we're supposed to do. So, Paul wants the Colossians then to have this full understanding of God's will by learning and understanding from God the Holy Spirit so that they will walk properly before Him in a manner worthy of Jesus Christ, in a manner of equal weight. We talked about that last time. Uh, A weighty life, a life of substance, a life of value, a life of meaning and purpose, a life that's equal to the weight, a holy life, if you will, set apart to God. Uh, We didn't talk about this word, and this is where we'll start today in our walk through the rest of this verse. He says... That walk, he says, so that you'll walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. That's important. We've talked about that. But now he says, and please him. To please him in all respects, in all areas of your life, in all circumstances, in everything that's come that God has allowed to come to you, you are capable of pleasing him. We don't always please him with the way we react or respond to what he brings into our lives. But we should be, with a greater understanding of God, be seeking to please Him. Ariskea is the Hebrew word, and this is what it means. It means to please someone, but you can add a greater depth to that word, and this is what the the Greek dictionaries have to say. Yielding. This is what pleasing is. Yielding to the will of another for their happiness. What is it that God the Father wanted Jesus to do? Why did He send Him to earth? He wanted wanted Jesus Christ to reveal Himself to all of mankind. When Jesus walks, the Father walks. When Jesus talks, the Father speaks. Everything that Jesus did was a reflection, a revelation to mankind that if God were to walk the earth, this is what He would be. Exactly Jesus, because He was the God who walked the earth. The other thing he wanted Jesus to do was to offer the kingdom to Israel, to be the Messiah of Israel, the Savior of Israel, and to offer them the kingdom. He he wanted the Son, the King of Israel, to come and offer the kingdom to Israel, and he wanted Israel to accept the kingdom, to accept the King, the Savior, the Messiah, Jesus. We know that Israel didn't. That's a story for another day. But there's something else that the Father sent Jesus to do. What did God the Father want Jesus to do? What would Jesus do that would please the Father ultimately more than anything else He did in His 33 years on earth? What was it? It was the substitute death for all of Adam's race. He sent Jesus to pay a price that humans could never pay. He wanted, the Father sent Jesus to save Adam's human race. Because Adam's human race, all of which we're a part of, could not save themselves. There's nothing we could do to get that job done. And so God sent Jesus Christ, who yielded to the will of the Father for the Father's satisfaction. Nothing that you'll ever read about in the Bible, none of these commands that we we have in the Bible are outside of what Jesus already has done. He has showed us how to live this life. He pioneered it. He went first. And He yielded His will, what He wanted to do, He set aside His will with every decision in His life. He set aside His will for the happiness of His Father. That's how He lived His life. 
What are we called to do? Exactly the same thing. Precisely the same thing. To set aside your will and your desires that they would line up with God's will for your life, His plan for your life, that they would be pleasing to Him. Guys, I hate to tell you, but walking through this life is not about uh, going from one pleasure event to another. Walking through this life is about finding out in the Bible how it is that God expects us to please Him and doing it. That's the walk of a Christian. That was the walk of our Christ. So Paul's not asking us to do anything that God hasn't already done in the person of Jesus Christ. So he wants them to learn about God so that they will walk in a manner that's of equal weight, of purpose, and that they would please God. And there are four results from living that life. That life that walks in a worthy manner and that life that pleases God as a Christian. I'll say one other statement because I have to. There is a way to live as a Christian that does not please God. You know that, right? There are choices that a Christian can make and maybe you're making them right now in your current lifestyle and you're trying to get back to God. Only you know that. But there are certain choices and a path that a Christian can go down that is not pleasing to God. Paul is offering, and the Colossians are guilty of that. I don't want to go through that again. But the Colossians are guilty of choosing a path that they think pleases God that is not pleasing to God. And that's why Paul wrote this letter to tell them, listen, this is God's prescription for a life that's worthy of His Son and a life that pleases Him. You got to ditch all that other junk. Let the Bible inform you. These are the thoughts. Four results from walking in a worthy manner is what we see in the Bible. The first one is bearing fruit. I tell you, this is another list we can use to evaluate ourselves. Is this you? We'll talk about bearing fruit and what it means in just a minute. But as a Christian, are you walking with God the Holy Spirit? Are you learning the Scripture daily? Are you increasing in the knowledge of God? Or like some Christians, do you think you know enough about God already? I don't need to continue learning about God. I don't need to sit in a Bible church. I don't need to learn the Bible. I've taught myself the Bible. I know enough about God. I've read the Bible for myself. And I don't need the part of instruction that is Bible teaching. I know enough of that. What does Paul say? That a Christian walking in a proper manner before the Father in a way that pleases God is a Christian who is increasing in the knowledge of God. Not one that says, I know enough. It's the one who says, I could never know enough about you, God. And wakes up every morning seeking the information from the Father through God the Holy Spirit. The third thing, being strengthened. Another result of walking in a manner worthy of God and pleasing Him is He will give us His strength. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Being strengthened reminds me of Philippians 4. I can do all things through Him who what? Who strengthens me. That's what he's speaking of here. Same thing he told the Philippians. And the fourth thing is giving thanks. Again, a list that we can use to evaluate our current right now today walk with our God. Did you wake up today with a hunger? to set your will aside and do what God wants you to do? Did you wake up with a hunger knowing, Lord, I am deficient in my knowledge of the Bible. Teach me more. Teach me more. Send me to the church. Teach me more. When I open my Bible this morning or in the afternoon, keep teaching me. Keep teaching me. I need to increase. Do you feel a strength walking through this life? And I'm not talking about some strange mystical strength. I'm talking about strength based on the knowledge of the Word of God, that God knows what He's doing and is perfectly in, in, uh, this world is perfectly in order. Are you strengthened, courageous, patient, steadfast in your walk with God, knowing that He knows what He's doing? And did you wake up this morning with the spirit of thanksgiving? Do you want to thank this God? Are you grateful for what He's doing? Or did you wake up this morning frustrated, mad, nervous, angry, uh, Fighting with God about what He's brought into your life, whatever trial it is. Oh God, why me? 
We all get there. I'm not pointing fingers. We all get there. And Paul says, if you're there, you're not walking in a manner that's worthy and you're not pleasing God. This is what pleases God. <clears throat> Bearing fruit. Let's look at what it means. Karpos is the Greek word for fruit. Karpos. So here, karpo phoreo means to bear fruit. Uh, it's to produce actions. This is what it means. This is what Paul's talking about. Obviously, we're not trees. An, an apple isn't ever going to grow out of my arm. He's using an analogy here. And we should bear fruit like trees bear fruit. We should bear fruit the kind of fruit that we are. So this is what it means to produce actions and consequences befitting one's nature. So I ask you the question, Christian, what is your nature? Paul says you should bear fruit in keeping with who you are. Remember in Galatians 5, he gives a list of sins before he gives that list of walking with the Spirit. Because a Christian can look like a non-Christian. A Christian can bear fruit that's not according to their true nature. They can bear fruit according to their sin nature that's not who they really are. Or a Christian can bear fruit that's Christ-like. And that's who we are. We are Christ ones. And we should be bearing fruit that looks like the fruit that Jesus Christ bore. Uh, another part of this definition, it's conceived of. This producing of actions and consequences befitting our nature, it's conceived of, and that's why Paul says bearing fruit, it's conceived of as a tree bearing fruit according to its kind. Now let me ask you this. If you plant an apple tree, what do you expect to grow on the tree? What fruit? Apples. And you, Christian... And me, Christian, when God brought us into His family at the second we put our faith in Jesus Christ, when we became sons of God and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus, our nature changed from someone who was lost and dead in their trespasses and sin to a member of the royal family of God. I'm looking at princes and princesses. The Father is the King. And in keeping with your nature as Christ ones, you should be bearing fruit according to Christ. We should look like Jesus Christ. Not like sinning Rick King. The world should be able to recognize us The world should be able to pick us out. Your workplace should be able to see you as different. We should be recognizable, producing fruit according to our kind, and our kind is Christ one, Christian. How are you doing at that? Paul says gives this list so that we can evaluate our own lives before the Father. When my neighbors, when the world, when people that I come in contact with, when the people at the hospital see me walking down the, uh, the hospital uh, aisles just completely lost, what, what fruit, what character are they seeing in me? Frustration, anger, bitterness... Or, or not? Are they seeing peace? Are they seeing a steadfast soul? Are, are they seeing who I should be, who God wants to make me? Or are they instead seeing this, this flitty little person that falls apart at every trial that comes their way? What do they see? Are we living as a child of God? That's the question. Are we bearing fruit in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions? Are we bearing fruit that's in line with the fruit of Jesus Christ? Are we becoming more Christ-like? Or do we just keep waking up every day, gaining a little bit of knowledge in the Bible, but nothing changes in our walk? Nothing changes in how we treat our neighbor, how we treat our friends, how we treat the barber, how we treat the girl at the checkout line at the Walmart. Nothing changes in everything else. I want it and I want it now. 
Why did you mess up my order? Why did you do this? Why did you do that? Why did the price of this go up? Everybody, this today, friends, everybody is on edge because things are out of control. You and me should be the outstanding example of difference. Not looking like the world in chaos, but looking like a Christian who worships a God who knows exactly what he's doing. Joyous and rejoicing. That's who we should be. Paul says we're to bear fruit. He also says we are to increase in the knowledge of God, to grow, to continue growing, not like that person who thinks they know it all already. We are to humbly come before the throne of grace, seeking God the Holy Spirit to teach us the Bible. To grow, the Greek word oxano, means to become larger or greater or bigger. Are we doing that? Is your knowledge of God growing? Or do you come to church and say, yeah, I can see where that's really important, and then put up the Bible for the rest of the week until you come back to church on Sunday morning? I don't want to castigate anybody, but I'm telling you right now, if that's your pattern, you need to change it. You have to change that pattern. Because Paul says, some Christian who's walking in a manner that's worthy of God and pleasing God looks like this. And if this isn't what you look like, I mean, the mirror of the Word of God is a mean mirror sometimes, isn't it? He expects us, all of us, until the day we die, to increase in our knowledge of God. And it was the time I spent in this verse thinking and praying on these things that make me go see Chico today. Because he has to, by command of God, continue his knowledge, his increase and in becoming bigger and his knowledge of God. He has to do that today. And if I can help him, that's what I need to do. He has to do this. This is a daily occurrence. Again, we have Paul here focused on the knowledge of God, increasing in the knowledge of God, like the third time he's used the word knowledge or understanding in the past two verses. Because the knowledge of God is the key, friend, to everything in life. It's not enough to say God knows what He's doing. He gave us the book so we could find out what He's doing. Paul says, I want you to increase not only in the knowledge of God, but in, of His will, what it is that God desires, how it is that He's planned humanity, what He has in store for the last days of the church on earth. All that is in that book, and we are to increase in the knowledge of what He's doing here. <clears throat> And God, uh, Paul knows that the knowledge of God is the key to a, a successful walk. You have to start with knowledge. It gives you meaning. It gives you purpose. It gives you focus. It gives you motivation. It gives you peace in this life. You can't find it any other way than in the Bible and in the knowledge of God. Purpose for living, meaning for living, a focus as we walk through this life, a motivation for doing things that please the Lord, and, of course, peace. Paul said it to the Ephesians this way. One quick verse and we'll move on. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, this is what the goal is to Paul. To the Colossians, he says, My goal for you is to live a life based on knowledge of the will of God and the wisdom that the Holy Spirit will teach you in the Bible. My goal is that you live a life that's worthy of Jesus Christ who died for you. To the Ephesians, he said the same thing. Knowledge. Knowledge, knowledge, until we all attain to the unity of the faith. Talking about the church, after he tells us that in Ephesians 4.11, he's gifted the church with spiritual gifts. One of those is pastor, teacher, that's me. To come and teach the church the Bible, not to entertain the church, to teach the church the will, the knowledge of the Bible, the scriptures. So he says to the church... That this teaching gift is given until we all attain to the unity of the faith, until we are like-minded in what we believe. And when we uh, attain to the knowledge of the Son of God, see knowledge again of Jesus Christ. How can we imitate who we don't know? 
to a mature man, a complete man, a filled out, spiritually filled out man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. We are being built up little by little, so eventually, hopefully, we will represent and be recognized as the fullness of Jesus Christ. Not in human perfection. We'll never be perfect. But we should be imitators of Christ and we should look like Him. And people should be able to point us out of a lineup. That one, that's the one. There's the Christian right there. Have to evaluate ourselves based on these things. I can't say anything else about that verse. When we exercise, listen to this thought. I'm telling you the fullness, the the understanding of God's will, the knowledge of God increasing gives us purpose, meaning, stability. And when we exercise our faith in God and that He knows what He's doing and we bear fruit for God, our faith grows there is a circle that's represent, or presented in the Bible, and this is the circle here in Colossians. Number one on the circle, we learn from God about God. God the Holy Spirit teaches us more about God. It's where it starts. After that, in this direction, we have more trust and faith in God to take care of us. The more we know about God, the more we understand God's plan, the more we understand exactly what's going on here in the church age in 2023, the more faith and trust we can have in God to take care of us. We have to learn about God as a provider. Peter says, cast all your cares on the Lord for He cares for you. We have to know about God to know that we can cast our cares on Him and trust Him and have faith in Him. But the only way we can know Him to trust Him and faith Him, or the only way we can have trust and faith in Him is to know Him. So we have to learn more about God. And then it continues around the circle and we get to this. We exercise daily faith and we walk through this life depending on God to take care of us. The more we know about God, the more we know He will provide and protect and take care of us, the more we walk through this life daily trusting Him to do it. And then that leads to the fourth prong here, the production of more faith. That's why I tell you guys sometimes when God works in a way in your life and you find yourself in a situation where you can't get out of humanly and God solves the problem, you should be writing those things down. You should be able to go back and say, no, I learned about God. I trusted in God. He did this in my life, through my life. He rescued me from that. And then the next time you have a situation, you have greater faith in this God because He's already brought you through umpteen trials in this life. And that leads back to the beginning, learn more about God. And it's this circle in life. We learn about God. We learn that we can trust and have faith in God. So we actually do have faith and walk in dependence on God. That bolsters and strengthens our faith in God so that we can learn, so that we can want to know more about God. And that's the circle. Welcome to the Bible church. That's what we try to do here. But unfortunately, the problem here is this. And see if you can uh, say amen to this or not. The problem is that most Christians, it's an unfortunate statement, but most Christians want to completely short-circuit this. And too many Christians want to go to the maturing process and they want to X these things out, look at the things they want to X out. They don't want to learn from God, about God. They don't want to be in a Bible church. They don't want to sit here and listen to this pastor drone on and on, book after book, chapter after chapter, verse after verse. Guy, couldn't you break it up and tell us a little story about your childhood? Couldn't you bring a little entertainment into the pulpit? Paul says that's not what we're here for. But unfortunately, a lot of churches, and you know who I'm talking about, you know the churches, you watch TV, you hear the reports. There's not a Bible in the church. And Joel's up there with his mouth full of teeth telling all the story. But it has nothing to do with this. 
And what does Paul say? You must increase in the knowledge of God in order to live a life that pleases Him. You go from church to church. They want to X that out. What else do they want to do? They want to, they want to X out the direction. We don't want to learn from God so that we can have more trust in Him. X all of this out. They want to X out the exercise of daily faith, of walking with God, depending on God, moment by moment through the trials that come. Don't want any of that. They don't want that to lead to faith. What do they want? They just want faith. God, give me more faith. Give me the strength to get through this trial. How would God respond? Give me the faith in you to get through this trial. How would God answer you if you said, just give me the faith to get through this trial? What would He say? Open your Bibles. Learn more about me from the Scriptures that I gave you that tell you about me. Open exactly this. Learn more about the Bible. It's in the stories and the accounts of the Bibles that your trust and faith in me will grow. It's through your understanding of my character and who I am that you will come to walk in dependence on me as you walk through this life. And it's that walking in dependence that will grow your faith. You want to short circuit all of it. Just give me the faith. I don't want to do the work. And God says, that's not how I planned this. That's not how I grow Christians up. What does Jesus say at the end of His uh, ministry, the night before He went to the cross? What does Jesus have to say about the way God planned for us to walk through this life? My Father has given each of you a bed of roses. Life will be perfect. You will have no hardship, no trial, no tribulation. Uh, My Christ ones will have everything they need. You'll all be rich. You'll never be sick. Or does Jesus in his final words before he went to the cross the next morning, does he say this instead? He says, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. And you say, yes, Lord, that's what I want. I want peace. But Jesus says there's a path to peace. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. He says, in the world... This is a promise from God, God the Son, Jesus Christ. In the world, you will have tribulation, trial, stress, heartache. Will have, not might. It's a promise. Because it's the way God has planned to grow us up in this life. He said, in this world you will have tribulation. But, Jesus says, through the trials, be of good cheer. Take courage, for I have overcome the world. And we hear Paul saying to the Colossians, Let God strengthen you, be steadfast, immovable in your faith, not giving up, and become patient Unfortunately, uh, no show of hands, but did that prick anybody, this information here? Stir you up in a way you didn't want to be stirred up maybe on this happy Mother's Day? I'm telling you, it doesn't matter that we're a Bible church, friends. There are people in here right now. I don't know who you are. Don't think I'm pointing anybody out. But I guarantee you there are people in here right now that this is their life. Don't want to go through that Bible thing. That's just not for me. I don't want to learn about you and how I can trust and have faith in you. I don't want to walk this life with the strength that God the Holy Spirit gives me steadfast in my convictions, knowing, Father, that as chaotic as it looks, you know what you're doing. I don't want any of that. I want faith. I want you to give me faith. Demand that you give me faith so that I can walk through this life. And God says, son, daughter, that's not the way we do it. This is my family, and I make the rules. And he's made the rules. If you want to look like Jesus Christ, if you want to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you want to please God the Father, and there's nobody in here that would say, no, I don't want to do that. I've got no interest in pleasing God. There's nobody here that would say that. All of us want to do what pleases God to a number. There's no doubt about that. 
But then we look at things like this and we say, well, I wonder if I am living in a life that pleases God. Am I bearing fruit as a Christian that can be recognized? Am I increasing daily in my knowledge of God? Am I doing what the Bible tells me to do? Am I being strengthened? Verse 11 says this. Oh, sorry about that. Look at verse 11. Knowing God's will, increasing in the knowledge of God, pleasing God also results in this. Strength for living. I'm not talking about human strength. I'm not talking about muscles. I'm talking about spiritual strength and steadfastness and patience. The strength that it takes to wake up in the morning and realize this world has gone to pot. But I can be joyous because I know what's coming tomorrow. I know what God has planned. I know the return of Jesus Christ at the rapture for the church. I know the tribulation. I know that Jesus will come back on His white horse according to Revelation 19. I know the future because God has taught me the future. So I can sit here just like this in perfect peace knowing that God will take care of me today. While the world crumbles, He will not allow the righteous to beg for bread, according to the Psalms. So we can have that steadfastness. Reminds me of this verse that I mentioned earlier, I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. We have to have the strength of God. We have to have this supernatural strength that God the Holy Spirit gives us when we walk with Him. This isn't mystical. This is part of what God the Holy Spirit does. When you confess your sins and you're walking with God the Holy Spirit, you are strengthened by the things that you know. And what does He say the strength leads to here? Strengthened according to His glorious might. Not my strength, His strength. Paul says... That whether I have things or whether I don't have things, that's the context in Philippians, whether I have nothing, whether I'm in want, or whether I have plenty, I have learned to be satisfied and I can do all things through God who strengthens me. He's not asking the Colossians to do something that he doesn't do. He does it himself. Strengthened. Two results of having God's strength. We got to we got to finish this. Or his two these two words, uh, the Greek word hupomone is the word steadfastness. If you have this strength of God, it will lead to you being steadfast. And what does that mean? It means the power to withstand hardship and stress, especially the inward fortitude necessary. The thinking based on Bible truth and who God is and what God's doing in my life to know I can make it through this because my God knows what He's doing. I can handle this hardship. I can handle this stress walking with God the Holy Spirit through it. I can do this and I know I can do it because Jesus has already done it. Be of good cheer, he said, I have overcome the world. I've already shown that this can be done. And so we can have this power to withstand hardship, this steadfastness, this immovableness. When the world says you have to adopt this, you have to believe in this, you have to start compromising your Bible truth, don't hold on so hard to that ancient Bible We have to be able to put both arms around that Bible and say, you couldn't take it if you killed me. And that's what this life can lead to. An ability from within to withstand hardship and stress, knowing God is in control. God knows. What else do we get from it? Makrothrumia. Makrothrumia is the Greek word that we have translated patience. And you know what it literally means? Long temper. Think of what it means to be patient with somebody like a, well, I won't do a like a, this is what it also means. Patient enduring of pain and unhappiness. Anybody have pain in your life? Anybody have any unhappiness in your life? No show of hands. Your hands will fly up so far the wind will blow me over. It's all of us. There's one way to get through it. Bearing fruit, increasing in the knowledge of God, trusting God, walking with God, pleasing God. 
being strengthened by God, the God that God will give us, patient endurance of pain and unhappiness. It also means self-restraint, which, is do, which does not hastily retaliate. That's being patient with the brother that all you really want to do is go pow. Haven't you ever been there? Come on, we live in the real world. It's not bearing the fruit of Jesus Christ. It's not bearing the fruit of the one who we are made in the image and likeness of. It's not being an imitator of Christ. So Paul says, when you walk with the Lord, learn more about the Lord. Let God the Holy Spirit lead you in your life and give you His strength to get through life. You can hold fast even in a prison cell like Paul when he was writing this letter. You can hold fast to the God that you believe in even while enduring pain and unhappiness. And you can be patient when somebody wrongs you. Have you ever been wronged? Are there times sometimes when that slap across the face is probably justified? Yes. But this is that turn the other cheek mentality showing self-restraint that doesn't hastily retaliate. So to cap this off, Paul is saying to the Colossians, and I'm saying to you and I'm also saying to me, if you don't have steadfastness in this life, you will lose heart. You'll walk away from this God. I don't have to name names, but we, all have, we know of children in this church that have walked away from their God. It's not an impossibility and it's not something that hasn't affected this church, this local church body. We all know people who have walked away from... Christians will be in heaven forever, but right now they are walking on a path that's not in a manner worthy of God and is not pleasing God. So Paul is saying, if you don't have this steadfast that is produced by God the Holy Spirit in you, you will lose heart. There's only one way to hold on. And if you don't have patience, you will become angry and revengeful in this life. Anybody know a Christian like that? Got to get my pound of flesh. It's just, it's just ugliness. It's human sin. Paul offers the alternative. Increase in the knowledge of God. Increase in your faith and your trust in what God is doing. Walk daily by means of the God, the, God the Holy Spirit in a way which pleases God. And that will grow your faith more and more. So when the next trial comes, you'll be more able, ready, even better than you are today to face that next trial. But you have to do these things so that you won't lose heart and you won't lose patience. Good place to stop. Father, thank you for the time you give us to look into your word today.